thing that really struck me when returning to Christianity was the actual historical records supporting a lot of the things that, well, growing up in a less, uh, we'll say, intellectually strong area, uh, I was basically led to believe that none of this evidence actually existed. Uh, and so it was quite a shock to me in my uh, standard mid-twenties period of spending all of my time learning about Roman history to discover there's actually a rather extensive uh, record of Christians and Christianity in uh, Roman history. But probably the most profound to me, and something that I wanted to include uh, when teaching my daughter uh, Roman history was uh, Tacitus' record. And you can you may hear Tacitus or Tacitus, that's just classical versus medieval Latin pronunciation, same person, I mostly will say Tacitus. Um, when you get to the mid-first century uh, is the start of when Tacitus is writing about his own life, and that's when you start seeing non-Christian sources writing about Christians. Uh, and this one in particular is so effective to me because if you learn about Roman history and you know Romans, you know Rome and the culture and the language and the people and their history, it is remarkable how much this little bit of text can tell you about early Christianity. Uh, I say two sentences, and for the bit that we're going to hyperanalyze, that is true. But technically, we're going to be talking about a lot of Roman history here, because the context is very important to understand this stuff. Um, but for me, for my own journey back to Christianity, that once I reach the point of, yes, I believe there is a god, okay, now which one is it? The historical proofs for Christianity were one of the most powerful things to send me that direction. And so I'm really, really excited to share this, uh, I would say discovery, but I'm far from the first person to ever notice this, um, with the rest of you. So for those that don't know, uh, Publius Cornelius Tacitus was a legendary Roman historian. Uh, he was more than just a historian, he was... Uh, a statesman, a bureaucrat, a priest, and a historian. He worked in the Roman government as an elected official, as a quaestor and a praetor, uh, and then as a prefect or procurator, uh, which we'll explain what all of those titles mean later, um, but also lesser known as a uh, uh, quindecumvir, which is one of the 15 uh, most important male priests in, in the empire. Uh, his historical works are really quite quite robust and prolific. Um, you can encounter people like Herodotus, who wrote a ton, and on all sorts of different different areas. But the thing you'll find about people like Herodotus is he often had no idea what he was talking about. Uh, he wrote about the phoenix as if it was an actual bird. Uh, it's it's not hard to question. Herodotus is writing. Uh, Tacitus is really quite the opposite. I'll, if you look at ancient sources, and we'll talk about this a bit more in a moment as well, you, you will often question them and find ways to poke holes in their stories, and you won't you won't expect they have much academic rigor. Uh, but Tacitus did, and mo the majority of his writing ended up being proven true in one way or another from other other uh, sources. Uh, the works we're going to be looking at specifically are called the Annals, which is actually a collection of, I don't know, 20-something books, I think. We're looking specifically at uh, book 15. And uh, the events that we're talking about is the Great Fire of Rome. Uh, he has several other major events that he had covered, but the, the most dramatic would be the Roman invasions of Germany, the eruption of Mount Vesuvius, and the Great Fire. Uh, and an important note is that birth date. 
So just, just keep that in mind as we proceed here. So here are the two sentences in all of their glory, we'll say. Um, and I hate reading to people, but since this is the whole subject, we'll, we'll do it for this short bit. That consequently, to get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations, called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our pure procurators, Pontius Pilatus. And a most mischievous superstition, thus checked for the moment, again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome, where all things hideous and shameful from every part of the world find their center and become popular. And this is from paragraph 44, book 15 of the Annals. Each of these highlighted bits here is something rather telling about early Christianity and the early Christians that you can get out of this text. It doesn't look like much on its own. If you read the text straightforward, it sounds basically like a footnote. Uh, maybe a footnote about there being persecution against Christians. Uh, but there's so much more to learn from this, and that's, that's where the context is going to be so important. Tacitus' sources, as we mentioned, Ancient sources didn't exactly have the most academic rigor. Uh, you will see people say that they learn things through a dream, or legend has it. Uh, that, that is not how Tacitus worked. Uh, for his writings on the eruption of Mount Vesuvius, Tacitus went to a friend of his who happened to be an eyewitness uh, directly to the events named Pliny the Younger. Uh, and Pliny the Younger was a... Uh, a witness to the eruption from across the bay, but specifically he wrote letters to uh, uh, to Tacitus regarding his uncle Pliny the Elder, uh, and one of the things that he had to say was, For my part I deem those blessed to whom by favor of the gods it has been granted either to do what is worth writing of, or to write what is worth reading. Above measure blessed are those on whom both gifts have been conferred, and the latter number will be my uncle, by virtue of his own and your compositions. That is not only a statement of affinity and uh, pride that Pliny the Younger had for his uncle uh, and his heroic actions at the eruption of Mount Vesuvius, that unfortunately we won't get into now, but I recommend reading up on. Uh, it is praise for his contemporary and the already known and uh, known as high quality works that Tacitus was producing um, because I believe the the annals would have been his uh, third book by then so the key event that we're going to be talking about here is the great fire of Rome in 64 AD and the asterisk is, is there as a note of the date not that the date is in question uh, the note of the date is, remember when Tacitus was born, 56 AD. Tacitus was eight years old at the time this happened. This is in his lifetime, and it was at a rather traumatic and formative event that he would not have forgotten. Um, and then, of course, all the secondary sources he had, he would have had to build on that. Uh, but we're going to read the uh, greater context real quick for where the two senses lie in the story. Um, but before we get there, this is during the reign of the Emperor Nero, uh, which scant a good word has been said about Nero, uh, especially in Christian circles or in the Bible. Um, he is very likely where the number 666 originated from, uh, and he was the first Roman emperor to really persecute Christians. During his reign, the city of Rome caught fire, and at this point, Nero had already begun experiencing madness and become deeply unpopular with uh, the Roman Senate and the Roman people. Uh, the, as the rumor would have it, Nero was up playing his uh, musical instruments while Rome burned and he did nothing, or even some would say that Nero set the city on fire himself. 
in order to burn down properties and make uh, room for his own developments. Right. So in book 44, or excuse me, paragraph 44, book 15, Tacitus is writing about the fire itself. It says, but all human effort, all the lavish gifts of the emperor and the appropriate propitiations of the gods did not banish the sinister belief that the conflagration was the result of an order. Consequently, to get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations called Christians by the populace. Christus, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty during the reign of Tiberius at the hands of one of our procurators, Pontius Pilatus, and a most mischievous superstition thus checked for the moment again broke out not only in Judea, the first source of the evil, but even in Rome, where all things hideous and shameful from every part of the world find their center and become popular. Accordingly, an arrest was first made of all who pleaded guilty. Then, upon their information, an immense multitude was convicted. Not so much of the crime of firing the city as of hatred against mankind. Mockery of every sort was added to their deaths. Covered with the skin of beasts, they were torn by dogs and perished, or were nailed to crosses, or were doomed to the flames and burnt, to serve as a nightly illumination when daylight had expired. Nero offered his gardens for the spectacle, and was exhibiting a show in the circus, while he mingled with the people in the dress of a charioteer or stood aloft on a car. Hence, even for criminals who deserved extreme and exemplary punishment, there arose a feeling of compassion, for it was not as it seemed for the public good, but to glut one man's cruelty, that they were being destroyed. So that's the full context of our two sentences here, and even in the full context, you can see that this isn't incredibly detailed. Uh, it's not... Uh, it's not an extensive work that covers the fire itself. Um, we don't learn a great deal about the reign of Nero from this, though the rest of the book goes into quite a bit of detail on it. Uh, but this is this is where we first learn about Christ from someone who was not a Christian. So to really understand the impact of those highlighted uh, portions. Uh, to really get the full meaning, you've got to understand quite a bit about the Roman world. And we can start with, really, what Rome was. Well, Rome, Roma was a city, but Rome as an empire and an idea has lasted much longer and expanded far past the pomerium of the city. Uh, initially, Rome expanded rather defensively, conquering the local tribes around it for their own security. And one of the ways they would ensure their security was by requiring that anybody they beat uh, provide slave labor and then provide men for Rome's army and their own defense. Which is rather ingenious. You conquer a, a group of people and then you make them subsidize uh, your defense, uh, which really doubly eliminates the threat that they would pose to you. And Rome did this basically for hundreds of years. You can see on, on the image here of their expansion that first they take control of what the region we know now is uh, Latium, uh, and then they expand over all of Italy. Uh, and after it, Italy, they find themselves in a uh, conflict with the, the Republic of Carthage. And then we have the Punic Wars, and just a, after that, an almost unopposed expansion across the entire Mediterranean. Uh, Initially, they, they were a republic. They had two heads of state called consuls uh, that sat at the head of a senate. Uh, that is a government of old men, senex, senate. Um, because they believed that, well, the elders in a group were wiser than any individual person, and they would be less likely to be a tyrant. And with a republic, you could theoretically remove tyrants. Uh, and... The traditions of the government and the Senate were based in the law, and the law to Romans was a was sacrosanct. It was it was something set up by the gods. Uh, there's an example of one Roman law that, and and this is one of the indicators of how broken the Republic was at the end, is 
you had this barrier around the city called the Pomerium. Uh, and initially it was just, it was an actual wall where the city, city wall was. And to breach that wall with a weapon in your hand was to make war on Rome. Because you couldn't possibly have brought a weapon through that wall with good intent. Uh, and eventually the city grew beyond that wall and the wall itself was torn down. But the Pomerium as an idea was still there and it was so ingrained in uh, in Roman life, the loss of sacrosanct, that when Pompey Magnus had a triumph uh, for one of his conquests and they couldn't fit elephants through the gate, nobody even thought to go 20 feet to the left where there was a massive opening because that would have required crossing the Pomerium in an illegal way. When people were conquered and brought under Roman law, uh, oh, there there were two two main uh, Roman, we'll say, philosophical ideas that were of importance here: is vassalization and citizenship. Uh, to be a citizen was to be a Roman, and that meant something very significant, a lot more serious than citizenship seems to mean to people today. If you harmed a Roman citizen, you would expect the full force of the Roman Empire to do something about it. Uh, as a vassal, you weren't a citizen, but your area was under Roman protection and Roman governance. And as a vassal, that is when then you, pr you would provide men for the defense of Rome, who then also defend your area. Uh, it's great to ensure security from outsiders at least. Um, and Rome had one more very important concept called Imperium. Uh, Imperium to Roman was the authority of the state, and the state was supreme. Uh, anyone who held an official office of the Roman Republic and later the Roman Empire was said to have Imperium. Uh, and this is a great example of why Romans were terrible diplomats, uh, because just imagine yourself as a diplomat being the physical embodiment in a person of the authority of your state. Well, you wouldn't find yourself granting the right deference to a king either, uh, and you would probably be very unpopular with whatever court you were at. And the, these concepts will be are important to understanding how Romans viewed the world. Uh, particularly in the later imperial age was imperial because the person who was the emperor had all of the imperium. They were imperium over the world, you could say. Uh, and that's why later in history you would see only one emperor at a time until very late uh, in the early modern period. So how did, how did these... Uh, conquest and vassalization work with religion. Uh, we can look at the Greek gods and the Roman gods, and basically everybody knows that they're essentially the same gods with different names, right? And that's uh, true, but it doesn't tell the whole story of how Rome ended up with a pantheon that was basically the Greek pantheon. And it was actually so much more than that. You can see in, uh, say, Hail Zeus and Hail Jupiter, like, you know, it's cutesy, but what, well, what is Jupiter? That, that's not the pr proper pronunciation of it. The proper pronunciation was uh, Deopater, godfather, essentially, uh, which is essentially the same as Zeus. Um, so the, the name even Jupiter and Zeus aren't actually all that different. So the, the Greeks have a much closer connection to the Romans than most of the people the Romans conquered, but the, con the Romans conquered way more people than just the Greeks. Um, and so how, how was Rome able to just copy the, these people's, uh, religion without much fuss? Um, why can't the same cutesy little, uh, dispute over names happen between Christians and Muslims? Uh, you'll never, you'll never see this stock photo garbage happen in real life. Well, why is that? 
why can't Muslims and Christians get along religiously the way Greeks and Romans did and basically just say, you know, we have the same, the same religion? Well, one of, one of the things Rome had that is really rather interesting from a religious perspective is that they didn't have a fixed pantheon. They never claimed to know who all the gods were. Uh, new gods were great for them. They could go and conquer new people and find a new god, and they were happy about it. It was great. So you always had a blank spot for the next new god, and they would encounter a new culture, and they would find their new god, and they would think it was cool, and bam, plop him into the pantheon. We've got a new god now. And if you encountered a, a god, and this is anachronistic, but let's pretend Rome expanded up into the Viking uh realm and they encountered Thor and Odin. Well, clearly Odin is just Zeus with a different name. Sure, y'all can keep worshipping him. He's the same guy, same god. Uh, and anybody that they have that we don't will put in the pantheon. It'll be great. Uh, and that worked really well for, uh, uh, for Roman expansion. It's how they were able to keep a kind of uh, religious homogeny uh, to the empire. But there were, there were two main types of religious conflicts that Rome would find itself in. And the first was with human sacrifice. Uh, there are rare exceptions that you may find in stories about the Sibylline books and uh, uh, the Vestal versions and uh, the Roman triumph about things that we would call a human sacrifice. But by and large, and by all standards that are essentially not Christian or Jewish, Rome absolutely hated human sacrifice. Uh, they despised it. It is hard to understate how much Rome hated the Carthaginians, and it wasn't just because of the wars that they found themselves in very often, but because of the fact the Carthaginians practiced human sacrifice. Uh, as Justin says here in one of this one of these paragraphs that they would sacrifice children specifically whose age excites pity even in enemies. Uh, and Tertullian explains that when some African provincials were found to be sacrificing people uh, to Saturn, they were crucified in intense numbers. Um, so many crosses on which the punishment on which the punishment which justice craved overtook their crimes. The soldiers of our country can still can testify who did that very work for that proconsul. Uh, because basically everyone was involved, so many people were crucified over it. Uh, and on this, Romans, Jews, and Christians would completely agree. Uh, we all despise human sacrifice. Uh, in fact, you would say the Jews and Christians were even more extremely anti-human sacrifice than the Romans. Uh, and so that would be something we ought to get along with. So why were there so many conflicts between Rome and the Jews? Was the, the model that Rome had for religious expansion and their flexible pantheon doesn't work with monotheism. How do you incorporate a supreme monotheistic unmoved mover uh, into a pantheon of polytheistic weaklings? Uh, it, it couldn't be done. But Rome respects tradi respected tradition, and they especially respected ancient religions. So they tried to tolerate tolerate uh, Judaism uh, so much as they could. All citizens, be aware that the vassal, Prince Herod, Tetrarch of Galilee, has come to the city. By order of the Triumvirate, during his residence here, all mockery of Jews and their one God shall be kept to an appropriate minimum. So they couldn't not mock Jews. They couldn't completely accept them. But they tried. For the sake of diplomacy and for the sake of respecting a fellow religion that despises and stopped human sacrifice, 
uh, for the sake of respecting another ancient religion. Uh, they tried to, but conflict between Jews and Romans broke out all the time. Uh, and, of course, eventually there were massive Jewish revolts uh, and leading to the destruction of the Second Temple and whatnot. Uh, and that's not to say that religious conflicts were, by any means, the only source of conflict between the Jews and the Romans, but it's a very important one to understanding the uh, the Roman world in a way that makes what Tacitus says so so impactful. Uh, another thing we need to talk about real quick is how Romans reckoned the dates. Uh, the Roman calendar, uh, for lack of any more sophisticated word, was weird. Uh, at the time that we're talking about, the Julian calendar was already in effect, but they still didn't have a year numbering system. There was the uh, year since the year of the city, but hardly anybody actually knew what the year of the city was. You can figure with a calendar that could drift three months out of date without people noticing that, you know, monitoring the the number of the year wasn't exactly a... Uh, prime interest of the people. Uh, so one of the ways that they would reckon the years by stating that uh, as an American equivalent I would say that I I was born on the third day of the seventh month of excuse me, the fourth day of the seventh month of the last year of H.W. Bush. And, like, you have to do a whole bunch of calculation in your head to figure out what that means, but that's how they would reckon something. I I was in Spain, Hispania during the year of Crassus and Pompey. You would name the two cons who the two consuls were. And consuls could repeat, but it was unlikely that both would repeat at the same time, so it worked pretty well. Uh, into the uh, imperial period, you would start doing the same thing for emperors, uh, which was a bit more confusing, especially during that transition. Um, let's see. So you, you would reckon time based on who was in charge, and speaking of who was in charge, let's talk a bit about Roman governance. So I mentioned that there were consuls, uh, I mentioned the word praetor. So praetor for lack of a better modern translation is judge. Someone who has the authority of the state to make judgments. Uh, and this was a big deal in the ancient world because judgment was something reserved for kings. So to delegate that power, to grant the imperium to someone else to make judgments was, was a really big deal. Uh, so Praetor was the second highest rank in the Senate you could get. Uh, especially during the Republic, um, but in the early Empire as well. And the Consul was the highest rank. There were two a year, and they held fasces, which you know, detect from etymology is related to fascism. It is the, the full might of the state and control of the people uh, that e each Consul had. But after somebody was a Consul, or after somebody was a Praetor, they weren't out of the Senate membership of the Senate was a lifetime affair. So they became something called a proconsul or pro-praetor. Uh, and during the Republican period, these proconsuls and pro-praetors would basically become governors of the provinces. And this, there was a bit of reform uh, during the imperial period for this. Like, what, what was the imperial period, real quick? When Rome transitioned from a republic to empire, most people never even knew it happened. It took about a hundred years for Roman citizens to know that there had been a change. Uh, because the Roman emperor wasn't called an emperor, he was uh, called the princeps, the first, the first senator and the first citizen. Uh, and he didn't even have the power of a consul. He, most of his powers were a tribune, that of the tribune of the plebs, which was the highest rank somebody could get as a plebeian. Uh, but what the real source of imperial authority was in the legions, and that was something uh, Octavian, the first emperor, really understood. And so the deal he made with the Senate was to give up all of his titles of consul and dictator uh, to remain a tribune, just the first senator, 
but he would remain governor of all of the frontier provinces, which just happened to be where all of the legions were. So the Senate can have their way with Italy, and they can have their way with the interior of the empire, where, you know, not a whole lot is going on. Uh, but just to make sure things stay in line and make sure the Senate listens to what the Princeps wants, he's got control of the legions. Uh, and that's where we get these imperial provinces and senatorial provinces. The imperial provinces governed directly by the emperor, the senatorial provinces governed by the senate, uh, and that's where curator and procurator comes in. A procurator was a, we'll say a more administrative civilian um, uh, member of the government. Uh, in this period that we're talking of the mid first century, remember we're around the year 64, uh, procurators would have been uh, senatorial appointments to uh, their provinces uh, for managing things like taxation and administration uh, but there was in the around this time was the transition of when we st started seeing the title prefect uh, which was the military counterpart to a procurator uh, and then that seems like a minor difference, but it'll it'll be important in a moment. So because Roman law was sacrosanct, violations of it often carried really rather severe penalties. Um, and probably the worst of which was crucifixion. Th this art here depicts a crucifixion of Carthaginians, uh, which it could have been over war, um, or it could have been over their human sacrifice, because that that was a thing that would happen. That we mentioned earlier that Tertullian wrote about Africans sacrificing humans to Saturn. Well, the punishment for that was crucifixion of a large number of people. Uh, crucifixion was not handed out to everyone. It was a rather serious offense. Uh, excuse me, rather serious punishment for offense. And it was actually more taboo uh, to hand out than modern people would think looking back. Uh, probably in part because of Christianity uh, and then just its depiction of media, people think crucifixion was like a really common thing. But actually in ancient sources, most ancient historians won't even use the word. Uh, as you'll see, even in Tacitus, for part of what we're writing about, he says the extreme punishment. Um, it was... I wouldn't recommend uh, looking into the actual effects of a crucifixion because it's much worse than it looks. Uh, but Seneca the Younger wrote about uh, seeing a, a large set of crucifixion once said, I see crosses there, not just of one kind, but made in many different ways. Some have their victims with head down to the ground, some impale their private parts, others stretch out their arms on the gibbet. Um, there was an incident around the same time that we're talking about, and actually Tacitus writes about it in book 14 of the Annals. Uh, this is also under the reign of Nero, about that tells us how serious crucifixion was and how serious the law was to Romans. So what we're re reading about here is Padanius Secundus, a former consul, which this is during the imperial period, so the consuls aren't as important as they used to be, but it's still the highest rank who's someone, someone who is not the emperor could achieve. Uh, and that means he had Imperium at some point, which means his person was sacrosanct. Soon afterwards, one of his own slaves murdered the city prefect, Pedonius Secundus, either because he had been refused his freedom for which he had made a bargain, or in the jealousy of a love in which he could not brook his master's rivalry. Ancient custom required that the whole slave establishment which had dwelt under the same roof should be dragged to execution. When a sudden gathering of the populace, which was for saving so many innocent lives, brought matters to actual insurrection, even in the Senate there was a strong feeling on the part of those who shrank from extreme rigor, though the majority though the majority were opposed to any innovation. Of these 
Caius Cassius, in giving his vote, argued of the following effect. Often I have been present senators in this assembly when new decrees were demanded from us contrary to the customs and laws of our ancestors, and I have refrained from opposition, not because I doubted, but that in all matters the arrangements of the past were better and fairer, and that all changes were for the worse, but that I might not seem to be exalting my own profession out of an excessive partiality for ancient precedent. At the same time, I thought that any influence I possess ought not to be destroyed by incessant protests, wishing that it might remain unimpaired should the state ever need my counsel. Today this has come to pass, since an ex-consul has been murdered in his house by the treachery of slaves, which not one hindered or divulged. Though the Senate's decree, which threatens the entire slave establishment with execution, has been till now unshaken. He further argues, that if the ancient custom of crucifying all slaves of this establishment is not upheld, then no rank of any person in the Republican establishment can be protected. And because the law was so important to them and their person so sacrosanct by their rank, this cannot be tolerated. Even though women and children among the multitudes were talking several hundred people in this, uh, in this establishment are undoubtedly innocent of any involvement in the murder of this ex-consul, it is so serious that they all must be crucified. But even in this, in this Senate record, in Tacitus's writing, they will not say the word crucifixion. They won't call it what it was, and we know from other sources what it was. Okay, so we have a few different sources on what crucifixion was, but really the point of this is that it was extremely serious and so taboo that even the Romans who practiced it didn't like talking about it. Uh, all right, and then moving on to Roman travel. This is a neat little site. I include the URL on the presentation here uh, called Orvis that you can estimate the travel time and cost of uh, traveling across the Roman Empire at its height. Even at its height, to travel from Jerusalem to Rome directly uh, would take you several months. If you did it by land only, it would take you nearly half the year. Uh, and that's if you left in the summer during the best time possible. And traveling by land only, you would of course had to feed whatever beast you're riding on or yourself every day. We're talking an extraordinary amount of money for peasants in antiquity. Currency conversion ac across that kind of time frame is basically impossible. Uh, but it, it was a lot. A lot more than most people could afford and it took a very long time. And that's on direct routes. There was uh, during World War II, General Patton was able to estimate in his time in North Africa uh, word of mouth among the Bedouin peoples as traveling 40 miles per day. Um, and that's probably a pretty good accurate, uh, pretty good and accurate estimate for how word of mouth would have traveled across the Roman Empire during this period as well. Uh, the uh, population we'll talk about in a minute but some parts were denser than others, so word of mouth was not a constant, constant thing. All right, so let's go back to the two senses here as we start getting into detail. Now that we have some more context, we can get back to what the two senses actually were and start looking into what they really tell us. All right, we're gonna address the easy stuff first. Now we know the reign of Tiberius. We know who Tiberius is. He was the second Roman emperor after Octavian. Uh, and his reign was from the year 14 to the year of 37. And what this tells us is really quite simple. It just corroborates the date of tradition of when Christ would have been crucified. Christians say either 30 or 33 AD. Uh, and this is right in that time frame. All right, thanks Tacitus, that, that one was easy suffered the extreme penalty that that's crucifixion so we have confirmed from a pagan source that Christ would have been crucified 
at the hands of one of our pro curators, Pontius Pilate. Now this is where things get a little more complicated because for a long time there wasn't any other, really any other record of Pontius Pilate other than Christian sources and then the offhand mention here of uh, Tacitus. Um, we have found back in the 60s or so something called the Pilate Stone. Uh, and what was determined from that is that Pilate was certainly a person, he certainly was a governor of some type in Judea, uh, that they would have called prefect. Prefect. Well, Pilate, uh, excuse me, Tacitus called him a procurator. Well, why why doesn't he know the difference, right? Uh, well, because the, the titles had been getting changed during that period. We're talking the difference between the, the second emperor uh, in the 30s and then the 6th or 7th Emperor in the 60s. Uh, a lot of change in the administration of the region between that time. But the title is really not that important. What we get is Tacitus asserting that this guy was a governor of a procurator type position, or a prefect type position in Judea. He had Imperium to sentence people to death by crucifixion. Now this is a pretty cr common criticism, and in fact it was brought up by people in the server recently. Is Tacitus just repeating what Christians have said? This is extremely unlikely. Look at the red text that is highlighted here. It says that Christians are hated for their abominations. They are a most mischievous superstition. The first source of the evil, hideous and shameful, deserved extreme and exemplary punishment. Tacitus hated Christians. That That is without doubt. He found them disgusting. Uh, and not just in the way that you would encounter, a, say, most of us would encounter, say, a, a JW type thing. Like, we, we would just shrug and be like, eh, I'm not a big fan of that. I kind of wish that wasn't a thing. Tacitus was okay with seeing them all crucified. He hated Christians. There is an extremely low likelihood that he would be willing to just repeat what a Christian had said and take that as fact. Recall that for the eruption of Mount Vesuvius, he went directly to an eyewitness. Not just an eyewitness, but an eyewitness he knew as a historian in his own right as someone of a family of writers, someone who was capable of writing with accuracy what happened. Recall that he was a quindecumvir, one of the chief priests of Rome. He was one of the 15 keepers of the Sibylline books. He knew Roman religion. He knew religion as far as the world of his day could understand it. Recall that he was a procurator or a prefect. He had an equivalent post to Pilate sometime in his own life. He had all the tools necessary to question rigorously whether or not any of this was accurate. And it's unlikely, if even possible, that he would have heard the story that the Christians were telling from a Christian. It seems unlikely he would have ever risked associating himself with one of them. And yet he writes the story almost exactly as a Christian would have. Except he does one more thing that we include here, this little interpolation. There is one very minor pious forgery that affected Tacitus's work. And it was a correction of a spelling error from Crestus to Christus. Because Crestus was a pun meant to insult uh, Christians. So a medieval scribe changed it to Christus, and that is the only interpolation of this text. So not only did he take the story and have all the tools necessary to dispute any of its factual accuracy, but he even inserted insults throughout the entire thing. No, I think the chance that Tacitus was repeating just what Christian said is extremely unlikely. And Nero inflicted the most exquisite tortures. And he goes on to name exactly what those tortures actually were. And this 
is something we take for granted now because we all have access to Wikipedia and who knows however many other encyclopedias that we can research. But remember that for a great deal of Christian history, most people couldn't read. And even if they could read, most people never would have had access to Tacitus' writing. And yet, the Christian tradition we have of the persecutions of Nero match almost perfectly with what Tacitus wrote down. This was the first state, uh, Roman state persecution of Christians, uh, which we won't necessarily say were rare, but they were less common than uh, people often think they were. And this just helps ver verify that tradition. But more significantly than just the tradition generally, we know exactly what happened to Saints Peter and Paul. We know from our tradition what time they died. They both died in the year 64, almost certainly as a result of these specific persecutions. Paul would have been beheaded and Peter crucified. And this is one that becomes more complex and requires a bit more analysis, but Tacitus calls Christians abominations, hideous and shameful. And that we see as a pattern throughout Roman history prior to the Edict of Milan, three very consistent accusations laid by Romans against Christians. Atheism, Thyestean feast, and Oedipodian intercourse. It means they don't, they're atheists, they don't believe in the gods, they're cannibals, they eat other humans, and they're incestuous. And that, that consistently ranges from the first time it's put in this order by Athenagoras in the late 2nd century, all the way up until the Edict of Milan. And we know from prior Roman history that what, what it takes to get a Roman to call you an abomination, hideous and shameful, someone deserving of crucifixion. Uh, and it's basically these three accusations. Well, the Oedipodian intercourse accusation comes from the fact that everybody called each other brother and sister, even husband and wife. Uh, and it, it's goofy in hindsight to us that, that that was a serious accusation, but... It's, po it's possible that even this one was already present back in the 60s. The accusation of cannibalism. Clearly a really bad misunderstanding of what the Eucharist was. Or does it tell us how literally and seriously the early Christians took the Eucharist? During the Orthodox liturgy, there's a point where the priest tells all catechumens to depart, and tells people the doors, the doors. We close the doors and we send out everyone who is not a full member of the church, because we don't cast our pearls before swine. We make sure that everybody who participates in the Eucharist uh, understands what they are doing first. The holy things are for the holy. Well, if you do that to Romans, and then they hear from somebody else that what's happening in there is they are eating the flesh and blood of their savior, what else could a Roman tell from that other than they are a secret cannibalistic cult? But these people went to their deaths in the Colosseum being fed to animals. They were crucified in the hundreds or the thousands on the basis of calling each other brother and sister or taking the Eucharist literally. And the last point is really two different points, but I find this the most persuasive, uh, or at least I did when I was returning to Christianity. This is the one that really stuck with me as kind of a, a proof of the truth of Christianity. And proof might be too strong a word, but I find it a very strong indication. Rome hated superstition. They hated religion 
as a concept even uh the the roman pantheon wasn't a religion that, that was just a fact and if you were religious about it people actually thought you were weird uh romans didn't like the concept of religion as we would talk about it uh, they they would use the word religion uh to refer to people that we would call a uh, quote spiritual Somehow, though, the city of Rome by 64 AD, and this is before Acts of the Apostles would have even been written, already has a sizable enough population of Christians that the Roman Emperor knows who they are. The Roman Empire had a population at the time of around 50 million people, the city itself 200,000. Uh, and this is a demographic breakdown here, citizen, non-citizen, slaves. The majority of the people were citizens, and the, non the other larger majority were slaves. 85% of the population of Rome never left the city. Or if they did leave the city, they almost certainly didn't leave the city to become some offshoot of Judaism. So in 15% of the city, 15% of 200,000, there's already a sizable enough group of Christians at this time for people to know who they are. And another point is migration flow. Cities through most of history, and until the cleanliness movement of the 1900s actually, uh, always had to import more people uh, than were actually born there because the cities were so unclean that they had a mortality rate higher than their birth rate. Uh, Rome during this period was a bit of an exception. It actually grew organically because there was hardly any migration. The majority of people in the world at this period of time would never see more than 30 miles from their home. But we see in the travels of Paul that he goes around Anatolia several times. He goes throughout Greece and the Aegean Sea. And he goes to Rome, and he only gets to Rome a few years before his death in 64. During Nero's reign, he was focused on senatorial priorities. The Senate did not like him, and it was very important to him that the Senate did like him, because remember, at this point, Rome is still pretending to continue to be a republic. He is not called Lord. Nobody calls him Dominus. He is the princeps, the first senator, and if the rest of the Senate doesn't like him, they can get rid of him and replace him with another one. He was addressing economic reform, uh, changing the amount of silver in each denarii coin, trying to fix prices uh, so that the price of wheat would get under control, battling black market sale of goods. Uh, he had to deal with his regency, having become emperor at only 16, and then he killed his mother. And he had to deal with the family politics of that, uh, and his own madness, the near rebellion that we covered earlier when the ex-consul was murdered and people didn't want these hundreds of slaves crucified. The Roman-Parthian War, which was a pretty serious affair. Parthia is a massive empire that could seriously threaten the Roman East. And then the great fire of Rome itself. He has all of these priorities going on throughout all of the time that Paul is doing these travels. And yet, by the time Paul gets to Rome, he already knows what a Christian is, or at least enough to tell them apart from Jews. And that, that's the important distinction. Because any monotheist that any Roman has ever encountered at this point in history was a Jew. They were the only ones. And they didn't understand Jews all that well. They didn't care to. They were a tiny minority. Uh, they made a lot of fuss in the East, and a lot of them traveled to Rome periodically, but... They weren't a major force in the Empire. And yet 31 years, or we'll say maximum of up to 34 years after the crucifixion, there's a sizable enough population of Christians throughout the whole Empire, and in fact in Rome itself, that the Emperor knows who they are and can tell them apart from Jews. That is a serious indication of how persuasive the apostles had to have been. This is, I think, 
one of the key evidences of the truth of the miracles of the apostles, and these are only some of them. But in a world as anti-superstitious, as anti-religious, as pro-authority, as polytheistic, as traditionalist, and as dispersed and slow-moving as the Roman world of the time, that somehow these people in massive droves were converting to Christianity. It makes absolutely no sense on paper. And some, especially younger internet atheists, would probably suggest, you know, that, well, the apostles were preaching to poor people, and it was a religion of poor people, and Rome had a lot of poor people, uh, and so they were promising something good for the poor people. What was good in the lives of the apostles? Only one ever made it to old age. St. Andrew was flayed alive. St. Peter was crucified. St. Paul was beheaded. St. James was beheaded. Uh, St. Thomas was stabbed by four different spears. Matthias was burned to death. Uh, James was stoned and clubbed. Nothing about the apostles' lives was a group of people empowering themselves. And so I would, I would give this a pretty good modern comparison of how this would happen. So, the United States invades Afghanistan and removes the Taliban government in 2001. It's a rather quick affair. But there are groups in Afghanistan, small villages, that still believe in dragons. Uh, and they'll tell people about it. This history that we're talking about of between 33 and 64 AD is rather equivalent to if somehow there was a massive cult arising in the United States based on Afghan dragons. Because their people go over there and they encounter this new religion that has all this cool stuff that appeals to them because American culture loves dragons. And they bring it back to their home country in such overwhelming numbers that the President of the United States and the whole Senate knows who these Dragonites are. And then w there's a calamity that, you know, coronavirus is going to be blamed on the Dragonites. It, it's so impossible to conceive of an equivalent example that doesn't sound comical. And yet, and yet it happened. That is just one of, one of the most puzzling things to me as, as a fan of history and someone who knows a lot about Rome. This was not a population prime for conversion and expansion like uh, Arabia was under Islam. This was a population that had every reason to oppose this religion and somehow did not. They embraced it at a really remarkable rate. And so we review all the things that you can learn from simply two sentences of what Tacitus says. We can learn about the first crucifix, excuse me, the first persecutions, that the, the details of a pagan source matching up nearly perfectly with Christian sources. A pagan source seemingly verifying the Christian narrative of what happened to Christ, uh, which I'll note that uh, this is something now, thanks to Tacitus' writing, that virtually every serious historian, even atheistic ones, takes as a historical fact that Christ was crucified under Pontius Pilate. So that a large part of that comes from Tacitus. That something about... Cri Christianity, as distinct from Judaism, was taken so seriously that it was considered an abomination, hideous and shameful, uh, and that within three decades, so many people had converted that even the Roman Emperor, in a world without the internet or any form of major communication, knew who these people were and could tell them apart from everyone else. That concludes this presentation. Please join us on our Discord for more regular content and presentations.